I V M. Hi, I'm Utsa, a behavior researcher by training and a slow traveler by passion. Postcards from Nowhere is a travel podcast where I condense a decade of travel experiences and explore not just the where but also the why and how to travel. My stories emerge from slow traveling the less explored parts of the world: Bosnia and Herzegovina, Armenia, Uzbekistan, and even China. At the end of each story, I give practical tips and new ideas about how to travel better. This week, in the third episode of the Great Migration, we travel from a small cluster of villages in Tamil Nadu to the agrarian flatlands of Burma to an urban home in Bangalore to trace the contested legacy of the Chettiar community and learn the lessons it holds for us. This is all from Burma, buddy. Mm-hmm. Um, if you see this, uh, this, is, this should be from 1940s. Mm-hmm. It's from then. Uh, in fact, could be much older to that. So these are things which I have preserved. This has come from my grandpa, mm-hmm. and I've ensured that I hold on to it. Uh, there is some Burmese love to it because my dad uh, in a Madurai house was quite a huge house. So we used to have this in a better way, mm-hmm. but. Since now I've come, this is my own house. Right. So I thought I'll actually it's high time I showcase. So it's in a, during a function we actually keep these flowers, you know, over this. Oh. Okay. And uh, there's there's a lot of history to it. Hmm. See, for me that's the whole point. In fact, many said you should get this gold dipped and all that. Hmm. But no, I didn't want to. Hmm. I was like, we got to leave it as, as it is. is hmm. As is. Now this is all from Burma. This is an avatar that Buddha, the king, when he was about to renunciate. Okay. That's this. Okay. So this so is this something. This is from the point where he was sitting under the Bodhi tree. Exactly. Okay. Where he re- he was like, I renounce everything. I don't want to be the king and all that. Hmm. So that was the avatar. Hmm. So that's something uh, I really preserve. Far away from Burma, this conversation is taking place in a high-rise apartment in an area of Bangalore, which saw development owing to the IT industry-led migration into the city. The gentleman whose voice you hear could easily pass off. as yet another young entrepreneur wanting to make his mark but as with all of life there is more than what meets the eye jaise mai is talking about a pair of bronze elephants whose trunks face upwards where the snout is shaped in order to hold flowers elephants are extremely significant in buddhism according to the buddhist legend queen maya the mother of gautam buddha dreamt that a white elephant with six tusks entered her right side which was interpreted to mean that she had conceived a child who would become either a world ruler or a buddha but the tasks of an element went beyond just dreams this is something that is more to do with our tradition right uh, this is from burma as well okay this is ivory if i may be allowed to say yeah. but it's more to do with uh, i don't believe it now but since it's been passed on i have it hmm. so intricate artwork and all that Uh, never have we showcased this right but i thought it's high time i actually showcase it hmm. uh i'm totally against all whatever it is the poaching part but these are some things which was amazing so i'm holding but these are all from bama okay and uh, i'm sorry i didn't this is lord uh, krishna krishna right this is lord krishna and uh, this is something which was you your this is something your father or grandfather picked up grandfather and uh, so this was a lord krishna creation in bama in bama a bombis artist would have carved this out out of ivory yes understood yes what he said was right jaisema's grandfather migrated to burma probably at the dawn of the 20th century jaisema is a passionate preserver of artifacts that he has from those times i am yet to meet a more reluctant preserver for his conflict of owning ivory and preserving the memories of his grandfather were a constant companion to our conversation but by no means his ancestors were the lone indians to make their fortune in burma in the multitudes that indian history holds a lesser known aspect is about a people who reside in less than 100 villages in tamil nadu but once owned a financial empire that straddled both south and southeast asia if you belong to the north of the vindhyas it's very likely that you have never heard of them but you may have sampled their fiery lip smacking food more popularly known as chettinad cuisine just like tamil nadu is the land of the tamilians Chettinad is the land of the Chettiars. In 1826, as the first Anglo-Burmese war waged in the region, the Chettiars arrived in Burma. 
They were identified as traders of pearls, arrack, cloth and rice in places like Sri Lanka and Calcutta. However, they were not only traders but rose to power in Burma owing to one very important occupation, banking. Around 1808, they established their first banking firms in Malacca, followed by Penang and Singapore. Ceylon or erstwhile Sri Lanka was their gateway to Southeast Asia, where they not only made their fortune but ended up gifting us a few culinary delights as well. The idiyappam or the string hopper has a Sri Lankan influence. A far lesser known dish, kavuni arisi, a black sticky rice pudding, has Burmese flavors. At the peak of their power in the 1930s, the Chettiars had 1,650 firms in Burma. The economist Chinmay Tumbe, in his brilliant book India Moving, A History of Migration, notes that Chettiar families would send out agents to remote places and occupy the position of the local village moneylender. Almost all the big families of Lower Burma had a financial connection with Chetinar through these agents. Agents were young men who worked for three years and tried to maximize their returns from lending. After accumulating profits, they would become independent and have their own agents. Interest rates ranged from 10 to 40 percent, and this became a point of contention. Here is a testimony of a local Burmese woman when she was interviewed during the Burma Provincial Banking Inquiry of 1929. Tersely and pointedly speaking, Chetiar banks are fiery dragons that parch every land that has the misfortune of coming under their wicked creeping. They are a hard-hearted lot that will wring out every drop of blood from the victims without compensation for the sake of their interest. The swindling, cheating and deception of Chetiars in this country, particularly amongst the ignorant folks, are well known. And these are to a large extent responsible for their poverty in this country. The Chetiars were the chief providers of capital to Burmese cultivators throughout the colonial era. However, their interest rates were lower than what the indigenous moneylender charged. Burma during those times had no formal banking system. The capital they provided gave the impetus for the dramatic emergence of the Irrawaddy Delta as a major force in the global rice trade in the latter half of the 19th century. This turned Burma into the rice bowl of the British Empire. To the colonialists, at least, they mattered, as the testimony of Sir Harcourt Butler, the then governor of Burma, suggests. You represent a very important factor indeed in the life of the province. Without the assistance of the Chetiar banking system, Burma would have never achieved the wonderful advance of the last 25 to 30 years. The Burman today is a much wealthier man than he was 25 years ago, and for his state of affairs, the Chetiar deserves his thanks. One of the chief concerns the local population had with the Chetiars was the fact that they barely spent any money in the places they lived. Much like most Indian migration, money earned was remitted back home. And this came up in my conversation with JSMI as well. These are wooden sculptures. Hmm. Uh, okay, so this dates back to your Chetiars. Oh, okay. Now this goes back to your Chetiars. Now, uh, I don't know if you know, so Chetiars are called Natkota Chetiars. So yeah. these are the guys who actually did... Uh, I think Kota means it's fort or something. Fort, exactly. Fort, yeah. So L- large fort, I can't get the. Not to Kota is country. So country, country fort. fort. Country, country fort. fort. Yeah. So these are the guys, even your sculptors, hmm. they actually were under the Chetiars. Okay. That's why even if you go to Karikudi today, hmm. you'd find a lot of wood carvings and all that done in Karikudi. Hmm. A lot. Now you had these huge chariots. So chariots were made of this particular wood that only the Chetiars could source. So you had all these huge, humongous chariots built by Chetiars. So were these uh, chariots made of Burmese teak or what kind of a wood was it? I really, I, I, okay. I really don't know. Yeah. Now, see, that's where Chetiars actually get another important role to play. Even in the society, even though they were I mean, considered as traders, to a large extent, they were actually treated as close to godly. Mm-hmm. Because these were the people who could actually build them chariots. These were the people who could actually help them with the funding of a temple. Mm-hmm. So Chetiyas were actually quite, uh, I would say they were revered a lot. Mm-hmm. Whatever said and In South India, Chetiyas were revered uh, from a godly perspective. Now, these were all made by Chetiyas. And this is from actually a chariot from Chidambaram, a temple Chidambaram, the Nataraja temple. Mm-hmm. It was the world's biggest chariot then. The chariot was demolished, which happens with many chariots. So this is all from that. And uh, It was sandblasted. Mm-hmm. It was treated for mites. But no paint, nothing has been done. 
So this is wood as it is in its elemental wood form. As it is in its elemental form. The reason why chettiars were held in high regard is that the remittances financed the upkeep of the Shaivai Chettina temples. Burma still has a Tamil diaspora and boasts of more than one Chettiya temple. Every year at the Murugan Hindu temple on Shwe Bonthar Street in Yangon, a procession with Lord Murugan placed on a bullock cart is seen. Closer home, the glorious Nataraja temple in Chidambaram, which Jai Simma refers to as well, was indeed financed by the Chettiyars in their heyday. Unfortunately for them, their influence started to wane owing to a series of global events. The 1930s brought about the Great Depression and global trade collapsed. It affected the ability of Burmese farmers to repay debts, and since their land was collateral, the Chettiyars became landowners. However, there was no one who would buy their land from them to recover the money. Parallelly, nationalistic sentiments in Burma were on the rise and Chettiyas took some blame for the wretched condition of the locals. World War II was peaking and the impending Japanese invasion of Burma meant that the Chettiyas wound up and returned home empty-handed. The rise and fall of the Chettiyas in Burma is a unique story in the annals of Indian migration history. Their overall legacy is heavily contested as locally they were seen as enablers and oppressors at the same time. Back home, the fact that a largely Buddhist agrarian population funded the glory and upkeep of Hindu temples is unmissable. It brings us to a unique crossroads in the history of migration. How do we celebrate the contested legacy of a community? How do we reconcile their fantastic cultural achievements with their questionable commerce? How does one see the actions of their own ancestors today? In an everyday fashion, isn't this at the heart of Jai Simma's conflict? An evocative emotional memory of his grandfather sharing space with owning ivory. As we go about our daily lives, we must, in any small way possible, preserve the individual stories and memories of our ancestors. Because we are, after all, the stories we tell of and to ourselves. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM network. You can listen to us on the IBM podcast app or ibmpodcast.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IBM Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. If you want to reach out to me, I am Utsav Memory on Twitter and YB Travel 42 on Instagram. Hey, it's been another great week on the IBM Podcast Network. On Cyrus Says, Mudit Dandwate, CEO and co-founder of Dozy, tells Cyrus how he built his health tech company and survived a crocodile attack. On The Longest Constitution, Priya tells us about the history of the rights of the disabled. This started in the 1970s with the organization of the blind. On a show about crypto, Rohan is joined by Kash Danda, who's a founding member at Super Team DAO. They discuss whether Solana is an Ethereum killer as is commonly believed in this space. On Press Decode, Sarah and Vagda discuss the acquittal of Bishop Franco Molakkal and whether the beautification of Purani Delhi strips it of its charm. On Postcards from Nowhere, Utsav tells us the surprising story of how money orders, Dehradun, and the transatlantic slave trade are all connected. Do follow us on social media. We are IBM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Don't forget to rate us on any of the platforms you're listening to us on. And also remember, you can check out a lot of our stuff on YouTube. Go to ibmpodcast.com slash YouTube and you'll get a list of all the various channels that we do have. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Bank of Baroda and Coinswitch Coubert. Thank you so much for making this possible. We know you love fast food. Fast fashion. Faster payment. Lightning fast internet speed. Then why not fast information? On Think Fast, where we discuss the latest developments in the world of technology, business, marketing, pop culture. With a side of sarcasm and my dad jokes, not just mine. Not mine, Varun. My jokes are funny. So join me, guys, the funnier one, Suchita Salwan, co-founder of LBB. And me, Varun Dugirala, the co-founder of The Glitch, as we think fast only on the IBM network. Fresh episodes out every Monday. On the IBM app, website, or wherever you get your podcast from.